Evening, everybody. If you want to turn to your text, Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55. Got an announcement before we begin. Um, we're going to have a Halloween get-together over at our place this coming Saturday around 2. Uh, we're going to have trick-or-treating for the kids, try to do hay rides and stuff like that. Obviously, everybody's invited. Um, if you need directions or just the address, it's on the sign-up sheet in the back there. And also, it's kind of a potluck deal, so if you'd like to bring a chili or something like that, we'd, we'd love to have it. So we look forward to seeing everybody there. Everybody's invited. So Isaiah chapter 55, before we read our text, I want to pose a hypothetical situation to you. I hope it's hypothetical. Maybe some of you have lived through this, but I hope that this is hypothetical. I want you to imagine for a second that you have a very deadly disease. It's a disease, if you don't get treatment right now, immediately cured, you're definitely going to die. And so you go to a doctor, right? You tell the doctor, I've got this disease, and here's how he responds. He says, okay, I think I understand the disease. I think I understand the treatment. I think it might be a surgery. Uh, but here's the thing. I'm not going to know whether it works or not until I do it. So I do this surgery on you, and one or two th things are going to happen. Either you're going to die there on the operating table, or you're going to live. But I can make you absolutely no guarantees. How would you feel walking out of that doctor's office? I would feel hopeless. I would feel despondent. I would have absolutely no confidence because that doctor didn't speak to me in any terms of certainty. Certainty, that's the word I want you to key in on. So let's say you go to another doctor. You want a second opinion, right? And you go to him, you tell him the same thing. I've got this disease, I'm gonna die. And he says, yeah, I'm completely familiar with the disease. In fact, I've been spending my entire career treating that one disease. I know exactly what to do, it's a surgery. I guarantee you, if I perform the surgery on you, you will definitely live, no doubt about it. Now, how do you feel after that? You're elated, right? This is the best news you ever heard. I'm going to live, because this man spoke to me in terms of certainty, right? Now, I heard a very smart person say this once. They said this, that there is nuance to all things in this world. That's absolutely true. There's nuance to all things, except one. That's the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It remains completely and utterly without nuance, without subtlety. It is completely and utterly black and white. And every promise God makes to his people, it is absolutely certain. Let me read you the scripture. It says, 2 Corinthians 1.20, For all the promises of God in him, in Christ, are yea and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. All the promises he makes are yea and amen. They are absolutely certain certain. None more certain than verse 7 in our text here. One verse, that's all we're going to look at tonight. Look at verse 7, chapter 55. It says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and don't miss the certainty here and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Notice the certainty. Notice the guarantee there. Let the wicked forsake his way, let the unrighteous man his thoughts, and he will have mercy. It's a guarantee. The question is, what does that mean? What is this talking about? Is it saying this? Is it saying that if a man ceases from outward sin, the wicked way, and he ceases from inward sin, the unrighteous thoughts, then the Lord will respond to that man with mercy. Is that what it means? Is the prerequisite for mercy stopping sin? Is that what it means? If that's what it means, there's absolutely no hope for me, and there's no hope for anyone else in this room as well. Now, I want to show you a scripture. Turn to 2 Samuel 23. You'll be familiar with this. These are David's last words. Second Samuel 23, it's verse 5. You all know this, David's last words. We're going to talk about the whole verse. I want you to key in on the last seven words. Verse 5, 2 Samuel 23. David says this from his deathbed. He has no reason to lie. Although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant. 
ordered in all things and sure, for this is all my salvation and all my desire, although, listen to these last seven words, although he make it not to grow. Now those last seven words puzzled me for a long time. Now I get the first part. David's grown. He says, although my house be not so with God. And you know what he's talking about. He's talking about his flesh. He's talking about his natural man. He's talking about his heart. He said, I'm no good. It's a cold, it's a stony heart, it's an unfeeling heart, it's an apathetic heart, it's a heart that's full of unbelief, it's full of lacking love for God, lacking love for God's people, saying, my house presently on my deathbed, it's not so with God, that's me. I understand David's hope, he says, but he hath made with me an everlasting covenant. Isn't that our hope? That God the Father entered into a covenant with his son, and this is how the covenant went. You get these, you get my people, I'm giving them to you, and you know what? I'm holding you 100% responsible. Everything I require of them, I'm going to look to you for, and I'm not going to look to them for a thing. And our union with the Lord Jesus Christ is so real that when the Father entered into a covenant with His Son, and the Son said, I will, without hesitation, He entered into a covenant with us. And here's how that covenant works. This is it. Christ does all the work. Christ gets all the glory. And we reap all the benefits. I understand David's confidence. He says it's ordered in all things and sure. He's talking about the totality of his salvation. He's saying God ordered it. He sovereignly purposed my salvation because he ordered it and he purposed it. He provided all things necessary to accomplish it because he ordered it, because he purposed it, because he provided for all things necessary to accomplish it. It's sure. It must be. It's all based on him. I understand David's peace and his joy. He says, this is all my salvation and all my desire. David's saying this, this is all I want. I want to win Christ and I want to be found in Him. This is all I desire, to simply have Christ, to be found in Him. I don't want anything else. I don't want any glory. I want Christ to get it all. This is where I want to stay. This is all I want. But those last seven words, although He make it not to grow. What does He mean? He means this. He means I was born bad, a sinner. I was born prone to sinful passions and sinful lusts. I acted out on a whole bunch of them, and the ones I didn't act out on, simply by the grace of God. That's it. And you know what? I ain't gotten any better. Those same sinful passions and lusts I were born with, I keep on falling into them, and I still struggle with them. From my deathbed, I still struggle with them. Same thing. Absolutely nothing has changed. Although, although I have the very love of God, although Jesus Christ is my surety, Although I'm a partaker of the divine nature, David believed the gospel. Although all that's true, you know what? Me, right here, David, in and of himself, nothing's changed. Same sinful man, always was. I tell you what, Isaiah 55, 7, if it means a man has to stop sinning, and that's the only way he gets mercy from God, there's no hope for David, no hope for any of us. So the question is this, what does it mean? What does it mean What is this wicked way that's to be forsaken and these thoughts of an unrighteous man that are to be forsaken? What does that mean? I'm going to give you two scriptures. I want you to turn to Proverbs 28. What is this wicked way, the way of the wicked? Proverbs 28, once you get there, I'm going to read you Psalm 9, verse 16. We're asking this question, what is this wicked way? I'm going to read you Psalm 9, 16. It says, The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Now this wicked way, it has something to do with his works. It has something to do with his works. Now keep that in mind. Look down at verse 13 of Proverbs 28. It says, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh shall have mercy. Now, did you notice what word I left out there? Them. It's in italics because it's not in the original. It actually does damage to the verse here. It is not saying, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh his sins, then the Lord responds to him with mercy. That's not what he's saying. It's whoso confesseth and forsaketh his works. The Lord shall have 
mercy. The wicked way, folks, is salvation by works. That's the way that's to be forsaken. The thoughts of the unrighteous are these thoughts, that there's something I can do to please God. That I have some ability to please God, that I have some ability in this thing of salvation. Those are the thoughts of an unrighteous man, and this wicked way is salvation by works. This is the way that's to be forsaken. I'm going to give you six things about this wicked way, this way of salvation by works. I'm going to give you a scripture to support each one of these. Here's the first statement. It is a way that comes naturally to a man. Proverbs 14, 12 says this, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now, how is this reality as we know it, this world? How is it set up? It's set up to where if you want something, you've got to work for it. If you're a man, you've got a family, you want to provide for your family, how do you do it? You work, and you work hard. And generally speaking in this life, the harder and more intelligently you work, the more you have. And if you fall down, you find yourself in hard times, no one's coming to pick you up. You've got to pick yourself up by the bootstraps. You have to work harder than everybody else to get yourself back up, right? That's how this world works for the most part. And here's the problem. The natural man carries those thoughts over to salvation. He says, I've got to work for it. And the harder I work, I've got to start keeping the law and I've got to stop sinning. I'm all for keeping the law and stopping sinning. Don't misunderstand me there. But those don't mean anything to God. It's all iniquity. It's all sin. In fact, the only way you remove yourself from mercy, that you exclude yourself from mercy, is to come this way, is to try to earn it. And the only man who gets it, gets mercy, is this man, the man who's not trying to earn it. The man who is doing nothing, he is simply resting and trusting Christ alone. Now it's Romans 4, 5, says this, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him who justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Or rather, his faith is the evidence that God has made that man righteous. Amen. To him that worketh not, but believeth. Second thing, it's a way that's highly appealing to the flesh. Psalm 140 verse 8 says, Grant not, O Lord, the desires of the wicked, further not his wicked device, they exalt themselves. Now, why does the natural man love this way, this way of salvation by works? Why does he find it so appealing? Because it opens the door for a man to exalt himself. Because if salvation is by works, that means if I'm saved and another man is not, there's something I did to make my salvation happen, which means I get to look my nose down at that guy. That means there's some glory for me in all this. And this is why the natural man hates the gospel and rejects the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, because that means salvation is completely dependent on on what the Lord Jesus Christ sovereignly did for a man. And that means it excludes glory for a man. It gives all the glory to Christ. Third thing, it's a way that's really easy to follow. Matthew 7, verse 13 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. This way, this wicked way, this way of salvation by works, it's a broad way, and it's a real wide gate. A whole bunch of different ways you can follow that road. All you have to have is some sort of confidence outside of Christ alone. That's it. Your confidence may be in your will. You have a false God who's weak, and he needs your approval, um, your acceptance before he can do something for you. So your confidence is you've made the right decision, right? You can hop on the broad way. You can stroll right through the wide gate. Straight to hell. No problem. Maybe it's in your works. You think, okay, listen, I'm not the best, but I'm better than that drunk over there, right? God grades on the curve, and I'm going to be just fine. My confidence is in my works, right? How about this? Um, I'm not great, but I intend to get better, right? You can hop on the Broadway. Works for you, right? How about this? Maybe your confidence lies here. Maybe it's there is no God, and since there is no God, there is no system of accountability, right? That's a confidence. Hop on the Broadway, waltz right through the wide gate, it'll work just fine for you. Right? Many ways to follow this way, this way of destruction, this way of salvation by works. But the way of salvation is a straight gate. It's a narrow way. There's only one way, Christ the way. This is John 14, 16. You all can all probably recite this. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, I've known you all a long time. Most of you can probably recite that, right? We hear that all the time. What does that mean? 
Now, he is the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh to the Father by him. What does that mean? I'm going to take a crack at it. Right? Here's the first thing it means. It means that outside of Christ, God the Father is completely and utterly unapproachable. He's a God of holiness. He's a God with a perfect sense of justice. And we cannot come into his presence as we are outside of Christ and find any forgiveness whatsoever and any acceptance whatsoever. You remember King Uzziah. What did Uzziah do? He bypassed the priest. He was lifted up with pride. He waltzed into the temple and he offered up incense unto the Lord. He bypassed the mediator. What did the Lord do? He struck him with leprosy right there and he killed him shortly thereafter. Because you cannot approach unto God as you are outside of Christ. That's the first thing it means. Here's the second thing. Right? I want to say this right. It means it's not good enough to simply plead Christ coming into the Father's presence, although we do. It is not simply good enough that we are represented by Christ, although we are. The only way you can come to the Father's presence and live is in Christ. What does that mean? That means this. If you are in Christ, that means you've always been there. The Father put you there. And I don't understand that. You've been put there by the Father, but you've always been there. And you know what? Since He put you there, you're there eternally. You're never going to leave. You cannot escape. There's a wall around you that keeps you in. You're there, and you've always been there. And you always will be there. Second thing it means is this. That man that is in Christ, he is justified by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That man has no sins because the Lord Jesus Christ bore that man and his sin in his body and he put that man's sin away, and he is justified before God. That is not a legal standing, that is a reality. It means this, that that man has the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. That the law keeping of Jesus Christ himself is that man's because he was in Christ when Christ kept the law. It really is his. Christ did all the work, we reap all the benefit. His righteousness really is yours. But it also means this, and this is the point I'm coming to. When Jesus Christ comes into the presence of his Father... And the father looks at him with that scrutinizing eye. He says, I couldn't want anything else. I find absolutely no fault in this man. I completely accept this man. This man has all the love I could possibly muster. I love him. He is absolutely perfect. I couldn't want anything else. He is also looking at everyone in Christ. And those same words, those same words that he uses when he looks at Christ, he uses when he looks at every believer in Christ. He's perfect. I couldn't want anything else. There's absolutely nothing else I desire. I love him. He's fully accepted. That's what it means to be in Christ. Now, somebody says, that sounds great. Awesome. How do I get in Christ? Wrong question. You had to have always been there, right? The Father has to have put you there. But what's the marker? How can you know if you're there? I'll give you two things. Number one, if you're in Christ, this wicked way, this way of salvation by works, coming into God, on the basis of what you've done, you completely reject that way. That way terrifies you. Because you know there's no salvation that way. There's only, only condemnation. Also this, your only hope is you're in Christ. Your only hope is that he did everything. That when he goes before his father, he brings you to in him. And you find that acceptance only in Christ. Is that how you feel? Is that what you're all about? Is that where your confidence lies? You're in Christ. You've always been there, and you always will be there. Number four, about this wicked way. It's a way that's dangerous to follow. It's even more dangerous to condone. Now, I want you to look at this. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 3, and look at verse 16. It says, And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth, and give them warning from me. Now if a man is called to speak for God, he's going to give a warning. He's going to warn about something. And I don't think it's going to surprise anybody at this point what it is. Look at verse 18. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way. What is that way? 
Salvation by works. To save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Now, I want you to consider the magnitude of that. It's saying if a man comes this way, he's going to die. He comes spouting off about his works and what he's done. He wants to be judged by God based on what he is and what he's done. He's going to die. But here's the thing. If you condone that, if you're a man who said you were called of God to speak, and yet you didn't give warning against this way, you didn't warn him that there's no salvation found in your works, his blood's going to be on your hands. There's a condemnation for that. Think about this, though. That's just for condoning it. That's for just not giving the warning. What about a man who endorses it? What about a man who says, that wide gate right there, that broad way, that's the way of salvation right there. If there's condemnation for a man just not giving the warning, how much greater it is for a man that endorses that way? Fifth thing about it. It's a way that the Lord will let you go if that's what you really want. Psalm 146.9 says, The Lord preserveth the strangers. He relieveth the fatherless and the widow, but the way of the wicked he turneth upside down. You know what that means? It means to lead astray. If this is what you want, if you want to come into the presence of God based on what you've done, you want to be judged accordingly, he'll let you go that way. He'll let you lead yourself astray. Go ahead. He just won't intervene. Unless he loves you. Unless he's always loved you, you have that everlasting love. Unless you're one of his elect, then he intervenes. Because the truth of the matter is, we're born in this world all walking down that broad path. All toward that wide gate. And if he loves you, if he gave himself for you, you know what happens? He intervenes. He reaches, he grabs you off that broad path, going towards that wide gate, and he moves you over and he puts you in the straight gate in Christ. Just like that. That's called the sovereignty of God and salvation. The Lord is the first cause behind everything. He is sovereign in absolutely everything. But this is his sovereignty and salvation, folks. It's an intervention. Stopping us from doing what we would do with the way that seemeth right. To walk through that wide gate. Nope, you don't get to walk through that gate. Not you. I've loved you with that everlasting love. Come here. You're going through the straight gate. Right here. Sixth thing. Finally, it's a way that leads to you getting exactly what you deserve. Isaiah 3.11 says, Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. So if you want to come into the presence of God, you want to claim you need to have mercy, you need to save me, because I, fill in that blank, whatever it is, you'll get exactly what you deserve. You're going to go to hell. Be put in that place that's called outer darkness, that place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, you get exactly what you deserve coming this way. That's a very sobering thought, but I'm giving the warning right now. Don't come this way. This way leads to destruction. But if I'm supposed to forsake this way, this way of salvation by works, where do I turn? Look back at your text. It says, let the wicked forsake his way, Isaiah 55, 7. And the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord. Now, what does that mean, to return unto the Lord? It's very simple. It means to come to Christ, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When you come to someone, you've heard this before, Todd said it, when you come, you are leaving somewhere, and you're arriving at somewhere else. You leave all this foolishness of salvation by works. You leave any hope. That there's anything about you that's going to earn you any favor with God, you leave all that behind and you come and you cling to Christ and you trust Him and you trust Him alone. That's what it means to return unto the Lord. Now, of all the prophets, Hosea actually has a fair amount to say about this. And so I want you to see some of the things he said about it. Turn to Hosea chapter 6. If you have a hard time finding it, it's Ezekiel, Daniel, and then Hosea. I had to write it down because it took me a long time to find it when I looked for it. Hosea chapter 6. Hosea chapter 6, verse 1. Come and let us return unto the Lord. For he hath torn 
and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. Now, I listened to a message by Henry Mahan a couple years ago, and this is what he said, and I'm going to paraphrase as best I can. Saying this, he said, he really didn't have any interest in talking to a man until he had a need. Until a man had a need of Christ, until a man had a need of salvation, he just really wasn't interested in talking to that man because he was just shopping for religion at that point. The question is, how does a man come about a need? Well, it says right here in Hosea, the Lord hath torn. You see, a man has to be torn. All his false refuges have to be tear, torn out. Whatever they are, whether, whatever he's resting in, other than Christ alone, it has to be completely and utterly destroyed. Well, how does God go about doing that? Well, he starts here with revealing himself, God, to that man. I use the word God because this is a collective God. In all his holiness, in all his justice. That's the first thing he sees. I can't stand before this God. And standing in the light of his holiness and his justice, you get a glimpse, and I say just a glimpse, of who you are. Nothing but a sinner. Nothing but a condemned man before a holy and a sovereign God. And somewhere along the way, he reveals Christ to that man. Christ the way. And there's no options here. This man is not making a decision. There's no decisions to be made. It's the exact same as a man who is drowning in the ocean and someone throws him a life preserver. There's no options. You cling on to what you have, and all you have is Christ. That's it. Now, here's my point in saying that. When we say salvation is by grace, folks, the whole thing is by grace. Even the return, even the tearing. A man will never have any consciousness of his sins until the Lord tears him. So we say it's all of grace. This is completely and utterly all of grace. But you see that too. He tore him, but he will heal him. There has never been a man that the Lord has torn. He's revealed to that man that he's nothing but a wicked sinner. That he didn't heal him. That he didn't show him Christ the way. Now turn over here to Hosea 14. Hosea 14. When I come to Christ, how do I plead my case? How do I plead my case? Hosea 14, look at verse 1. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with you words. So you've got to say something. You've got to plead your case. Take with you words. And turn to the Lord and say unto him, first thing, take away all iniquity. Second thing, receive us graciously. And here's the end state. So will we render the calves or the sacrifices of our lips. Take with you words. How should I plead my case when I come to Christ? Well, you start here with this statement. Take away all iniquity. What separates us from our God? What kindled the anger of God towards us? Folks, it's our sin. It's our iniquity. And here's where we come pleading our case. Lord, do something about my sin. There's absolutely nothing I can do about it. There, I can't stop. Something has to be done about my sin, and there's nothing I can do about it. Do something about my sin. That's how you start pleading your case. Here's the second thing. And receive us graciously. Don't look for a reason in me to do it. If you look for a reason in me to do this, to take away my iniquity, to do something about my sin, you're not going to find it. Look in yourself. Because you're a gracious God. Because you say you delight in mercy. Because you say you're the friend of sinners. Because you say, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Because you say this. It's a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came to this world to save sinners. In fact, the chiefest of them. You said all that. Don't look for a reason in me to do it. Look for the reason in you to do it. Receive us graciously. And here's the end state of all that. Here's what happens. So we render the calves or the sacrifices of our lips. You're a God that demands to be worshipped. This whole thing is about really one thing. It's about your glory. You demand that there be a trophy there that you can stand up and say, this guy's a trophy of my power and my grace. You know what, Lord? If you do that, if you do this for me and enemy, you know what I'll be? I'll be that really loud trophy. I won't have a choice. You say you want somebody to worship you? I won't have a choice. I'll be that loud trophy saying, I'm here because of this man. That's it. Now, coming to Christ, how will I be received? Now, that's a legitimate question because I think many times we have concerns about that, don't we? Will he receive me? 
Is he willing to receive me? What would that look like? Luke chapter 15. This is very familiar to all of you. This is the parable of the prodigal son. We're just going to look at a small portion of it because I want you to see just one thing. But you all remember this story. This is a story about a young man, a man whose father was very wealthy, and his son is kind of an entitled brat. And he goes to his father and he says, I want my inheritance early. He didn't deserve it. He hadn't earned any of it. But his father was a gracious man, so he gave it to him. That man went and he spent it on riotous living. And after the money wore out, he found out that he was in need. He was in want. And so he was feeding pigs. And he was having to survive off the same things that the pigs survived off of. That man was in a place to where he couldn't provide for himself. And he was completely dissatisfied with himself. And what a blessing that is to be found in that place. What we're going to pick up is where it says, this man came to himself. This is what happens when the Lord intervenes. Look at verse 17. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will rise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Where is that sense of entitlement now? It's gone, isn't it? This man knows one thing. He's going to go home to his father. If his father says, Listen, you punk. I gave you everything you asked me to give you, and you've squandered every bit of it. Get off my property. I never want to see you again. Is his father wrong? He sure didn't think so. But look at how his father receives him. This is the point. Look at verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now, here's what I want you to notice there. His father made absolutely no mention of his past transgressions. That could have went a whole lot different, couldn't have? His father could have came up and been like, oh, look who's back. I thought you had it all figured out. You said, give me my inheritance. I thought you had it all figured out. You were going to be big shot, right? Look who's crawling back. Absolutely no mention of this man's transgressions whatsoever. And he didn't hold him off at arm's length and say, listen, I'm going to put you on a, I'm going to give you a trial run, right? You come back for a little while, you do some work for me, we'll see how things go. If you're obedient, maybe you can stick around some more. Absolutely nothing like that. He ran, he fell on his son, and he kissed him, and kissed him, and kissed him, and he received him gladly because he was his son. Look at this, look at verse 21. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Now I want you to notice something there. He's had this speech planned out, right, for however long he's been walking, right? Father, I've sinned against heaven, I've sinned against you. He's got this whole thing mapped out. This is his confession. And then as he's trying to get this out, he can't even get the whole speech out because his father is just sitting there hugging him and kissing him and roughing him up and stuff like that. And he has to just stop because his father's like, just, just shut up. Just be quiet. We are never going to mention the fact that you left ever again. I have no memory of it. Here's my point in all this. If anybody has any reservations about coming to the Lord Jesus Christ and begging him for mercy... And clinging to him. Do I have that right to believe on Christ? Folks, this is exactly how you'll be received. No mention of past transgressions whatsoever. No holding you off at arm's length, saying, we'll put you on a trial period and see how you do. Absolutely nothing like that. You're my son. Come home. You're my daughter. Come home. Put the best robe on him. The very righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's what you'll have. Put a ring on his finger. It's a perfect circle. So it signifies eternity part of the covenant, the eternal covenant that David talked about. You see, he's part of this covenant. Before time ever began, my father gave him to me. And you know what? Come on back. I knew you were going to come back. That's why I was looking for you. That's why I ran towards you. You were coming back. That's what this is all about. When we put that ring on your finger, you want to mind. Part of that eternal covenant. Put shoes on his feet. New walk, new history. Everything Jesus Christ has done, that's what you've done. Whatever he has not done, 
you haven't done that thing. That's how you'll be received. Free for nothing. Graciously, with all love and kindness. Why wouldn't you come? All right. In conclusion, I'm going to give you four statements. I'm not going to make any comment about these. I just want to leave you to stew on. When we were looking at our text, what I told you is what drew that to me was the certainty of it. He will have mercy, and he will abundantly pardon. So here's four certain statements. Here's the first one. If you approach unto God by the wicked way, salvation by works, based on what you've done, you will certainly die. It will end in destruction. I want you to understand that. That's the first certainty. Here's the second one. If you return unto Christ, he will certainly receive you. Free for nothing. He won't hold you off in any way, shape, or form. You'll be received as a son. Third thing. If you return you will certainly be shown mercy. See, this is not one of those things where it's up in the air, right? Well, God's sovereign. I guess we'll just have to figure it out on Judgment Day. Absolutely not. This is a God that deals in certainty. If you come, forsake this way, you'll be given mercy. You'll be shown mercy. And you will be abundantly pardoned. You know what that word abundantly means? Completely. Complete and utter pardon. You won't be guilty of anything. And here's the fourth statement. If you do return, it's certainly by His grace and through His sovereign intervention. You see, if you return, it's because He always knew you were going to return, because He purposed your return and caused your return. This is all His work. So I'm going to leave you this thought. Folks, return unto the Lord. Forsake that wicked way. Forsake those unrighteous thoughts and return. Come to Christ. We'll stop there. Mm -hmm.